Well, we'll get started here. Uh, I think this is working. <clears throat> uh, my name is Bill Martinson. I live in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. I uh, am a member of the Northern Lights Oliver Collectors Chapter, which is maybe one of the newer ones in the network. But I worked at uh, White from 70 to 75. And that was the bookends of the merger. Actually, it started in 1969 with the business merger, which was redone again in 1970, and again in 71. They had trouble getting it right. And it ended in 1975 when we transitioned over to the white product line. I happened to be on the production line when the 2255 went down the line, uh, you know, the last Oliver. <clears throat> I was also on a production line when the 2105, the first white, went down the line shortly thereafter I left the company. Um, so this is not a presentation about iron. If that's what you're expecting, I apologize. But this is about people power and politics. And I'm basing my information on what we learned there at the time and what I've been able to put together since that time when things aren't done right, it gnaws at you. And, uh, and then there's a couple of, of uh, resources that are really good. One is this book written by John Culbertson, Tractor Builders, that's on the Oliver side. The other one is the history of Minneapolis Moline and White Motor Corporation by Bob Singer and Mike Verholst on the Moline side. Um, so I didn't know what to title this thing, but I said, well, I'm going to kind of focus on what took out Oliver, because I think that's what maybe bothers a lot of us. I don't think it had to happen, but it did. And I, re I should really say there who took out Oliver. And so we're going to talk about that stuff. But I had to go all the way back to the acquisition of Oliver by White to deal with why Oliver got taken out. And there's three questions there that we have to deal with. <clears throat> why did White buy Oliver? Why did Oliver sell to White? They didn't have to, but they did. And then why did buy, uh, uh, White buy Minneapolis Moline? A little background on White. Um, there actually ended up being two White corporations in Cleveland, White Consolidated Industries and White Motor Corporation. And back in 19, 1866, a guy by the name of Thomas White founded White <clears throat> Industries, which ultimately became White Consolidated Industries making white sewing machine. It was very successful. The company grew. They diversified into different things. You had two sons that were very capable, came into the business, and they started fooling around with steam-powered automobiles and stuff like that, and they kind of formed an auto group. And But Thomas didn't like that, so he spun it off, and that became White Motor Corporation. So White Motor Corporation was an outgrowth of White Consolidated Industries, both in Cleveland, and both of them were intertwined in the mess of the merger. Uh, the other thing is that in 1916, White Motor founded Clee Track, and in 1944, they sold Clee Track to Oliver. So that was the beginning of a relationship between the two companies. Um, in ultimately, White Motor Corporation became a trucking company. And they did a lot of acquisitions of, of different truck companies and then into the farm and other stuff, Hercules to get into the engine business. But they became the big four of trucks. They were the, if you add up all their brands, they were the largest trucking company in the country. And in 1958, I highlighted Diamond T. They, they purchased Diamond T and I'm gonna come back to that one. And then they did an attempted takeover of the engine, Cummins Engine Company. Uh, I don't know what year that was, but somewhere in the 50s, I think late 50s, and that was blocked by the Justice Department. 
Um, so why did White buy Oliver? Now on social media, you read things like, well, White couldn't make money building trucks, so they had to buy, oh, and Oliver spun off a lot of money making tractors, so they need Oliver's money to fund the trucks. That's not true. Uh, both businesses were cyclical. In fact, ag was probably more cyclical than trucks. Um, what we always heard was that the reason that White bought Oliver was one thing, that after the head of White Motor Corporation uh, just felt they needed to have their own engine. Mack Truck had an engine, and they felt they needed, as the biggest trucking company, they needed their own engine too to have the margins and things like that that they needed. But they could not fund, so they wanted to develop this new, new engine, build a plant to make it in, but they couldn't fund that plant based on truck engines alone. And the reason is this, is that um, when you buy a truck, Engines are an option. You can buy Cat or Cummins or Detroit Diesel. It wasn't a captive market like tractors. And um, so they knew that when they came out with their truck line, it would take while, a while to ramp up the volume. So they needed the baseline of the ag volume to make this thing fly. And their break-even point was 21,000 engines per year. And they figured it would take four years to hit that point with the truck volume ramping up. And so that's what we heard why White bought Oliver, it was just to, to, to fund this engine plant. And I think they sought Oliver, they had that prior connection with Fleet Track, but Oliver was the only tractor company that didn't have their own engine. So, um, and then you might say, well, why did they buy Moline? And I think there was only one reason, it, 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 Moline came to them and it just raised that line a little bit more. So added a little bit more to the engine volume. This one here is an interesting discussion. Why did Oliver sell to White? And I think, you know, one thing I would say is there's not, a, you can't go out on the internet and learn a lot by searching on Oliver because all that history was pre-internet. Now everything is stored out there. So it's hard to gather stuff, but I think the number one reason was they had stockholders with a desire to cash out. And I, I don't know if anybody here knows this, but from what I can tell, Oliver stock was not, it was sort of privately held. It wasn't sold on an open market, so it wasn't real liquid. And I think there are a lot of local people in the early days of Hart and Parr and all this that, that had money in the company and they're probably getting older and wanted to cash out. So I think that was one thing. The second thing is Oliver, you know, the ag industry could have severe droughts. And you can read in John Colbert's about him in his book, you know, there's times when, when the factory was shut down for many months because the sales were practically nothing. You know, and it was tough to cash flow through those periods of time. And all the ag people wanted to diversify. And most of them, did so by moving into industrial products. John Deere did, Case did, and Oliver did to some degrees too. They developed a line of industrial products based on the 550, 1650, and 1950. But still, there would be those droughts, and so they were, well, I'll just, uh, if you look here, 1957, this, this is out of John Culbertson's book, that Elva Phelps, president of Oliver, put the word out that Oliver was merger-minded and that the company was considering three or four proposal to, proposals to marry with other companies. Well, this was a year after they entertained discussions with Case on a merger that was called off. And I can't think of a, I mean, that'd be a terrible merger, but, uh, and a worse one over here is Studebaker. They had talks with Studebaker about merging and you'd say, why in the world Studebaker, you know? I mean, it had failed in the car industry already. They came out with the Lark, if any of you can remember that, that brought a little bit of life back into the company, but, um, and I suspect the reason they were talking to Studebaker was is that the Studebaker plant was right next to the Oliver plant in South Bend. I think it's gone now, but here is a little clip that I caught out of the New York Times there in 1960, January of 1960, where they dropped discussion of merging with Studebaker. That would have been way worse than White. Um, 
but it was later in 1960 when the, I believe the thing with the deal with White was pulled off. So they were aggressively seeking a suitor. But another thing to note here is that um, these mailman brothers, I remember I said so they sold Diamond T to White in 58. Then they invested their money in Oliver and they got on the board. They were, I think, venture capitalists. And if you go back in the history of Minneapolis Moulin, and all, I didn't realize this about Oliver, also with Cox, that they, they, they all had issues with venture capitalists moving in and, I'm going to say, damaging the com company. But I, I think these Mailman brothers had a lot to do with selling to White. Uh, another reason why Oliver might have been interested in selling was to stabilize their engine situation because that, in my opinion, and I'm going to talk more about that Waukesha relationship wasn't working for them. And when I say that, I'm not saying it was a bad engine, but I'm saying the strategy was not delivering. Why did bite, uh, White buy Minneapolis Moulin? Well, I'm going to talk about a Reddick connection. The Reddicks, Ed and Henry Reddick, were the venture capitalists that invaded Moline and took over it for a while and milked, I'll talk more about that later, milked the company. But at that point in time, Minneapolis Moline was no longer a viable standalone company. And I think it was available probably relatively cheap, but I think the key thing was just more engine volume to fund that engine plant. So, the merger. Uh, like I said, the business merger happened initially in 1969. I'm talking about the merging of Minneapolis Moulin and Oliver into White Farm Equipment at the business level. This is not the product level yet. They redid it in 70 and they redid it in 71 trying to get it right. And it was ugly. I'm just telling you, it was ugly in there. Per John Culbertson again, it is remarkable that the company survived the internal wars and continued, continued on for two more decades. And then, of course, we had the product merger in 75, and that was uh, the end of Oliver. And I'll, I'll pick out a guy that we can blame, maybe two. Now some key players, and I hope this isn't boring, but all of this comes down to people and positions of power and making decisions, and some of them were good and some of them were bad. First one was Neb Bauman. He was president and CEO of White Motor. Through their growth years, he was the one that was the architect of the of the uh, white engine, you know, the white search at the top of the uh, truck market. He formed this what we called APD Advanced Products Division to develop the white engine and the hydromechanical transmission and a new closed center hydraulic pump for the tractors. That was all the component design that was out in California. He was a very capable person, but his world came apart in 1970. He ended up being taken out because of company debt, a divorce thing, and bad market conditions. So the second, I call it a player here, is a Cleveland Plain Dealer newspaper. Now back then, there wasn't the internet for information. And so the only way we could get, we, had to, we always had to know what's the rumors out of Cleveland because that's where it was all happening. So there was one guy in the admin building which was across the street from the engineering department that subscribed to the Cleveland Plain Dealer newspaper and he would read it every day and if there's something in there, it spread through the whole place real quickly. <laughs> so that was our, our news source. And there was this guy, Ed Reddick, and I have to, I'll, well, we'll talk more about him. But Ed Reddick, was a turnaround expert. Now, I don't know, I worked for a turnaround guy for a couple of years, and these guys can be ruthless, they're quick, but they go in and cut costs when costs need to be cut. And he was, so he earned that trait with Arthur Anderson, Ed was an accountant, and uh, Arthur Anderson was an account, big accounting firm. Then he became vice president of White Motor Corporation. And then from there he moved over as president of White Consolidated, Consolidated Industries, and during that period of time, him and his brother Henry did a hostile takeover of Minneapolis Moline. And I hadn't been there for, I don't think, two weeks. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm starting work in 1970, 
this was mid 50s and the Minneapolis mean people were still mad about this and I heard about it as Ed Reddy came in and bought our company and sold all the assets and 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 uh, pocketed the money and left and I think they ran the company for about two years and I'm sure he was you know part of the reason that um, uh, Minneapolis Moon got sold to White Motor because he had connections in there, but he, this is what they wrote about him. He was ruthless. He'd target companies that were sickly but not terminal. He would pay bargain basement prices for them and then sell assets slash overhead and excess product lines and employees until they, they could make money. He hated research and development. He did not like computer systems. And in the end, he made a couple attempts to take over White Motor Corporation as head of White Consolidated Industries. Didn't work. He ended up with the Hercules Engine Company. That was Ed Reddick. We're not done with him yet. <clears throat> uh, key players on the farm group side. First, Sam White Jr. He was president of Oliver during the heydays of the, of the uh, 60s. He was probably one of their best presidents. He's worked his way up from the bottom of the company to president. He was a leader with great customer skills. And I, some of this I learned, uh, Sherry Schaefer talked about him at the Michigan Summer Show last summer. But his father was a merger and acquisition expert that was involved in putting the original Oliver Corporation together. In other words, bringing Hart Parr, the Oliver Plow Group, uh, Nichols and Shepard and what American Cedar or whatever the group of companies was. Uh, Sam and this again, I because I al always wondered, the end of Oliver turned out completely wrong. It was totally un-Sam White. It's not the way he would do it. And what happened to him? Well, she said he was forced out because he wouldn't cook the books. I'm going to talk about why they had to cook the books. Underneath Sam, while he was still there, was Bob Cumming, who was president of Minneapolis Moline, and Jim Warmly, who was president of Oliver. Bob Cumming came out of White Motor Corporation, a connection there. He became president of White Farm after Sam White's ouster. Bob is the one that pulled off the merger. He was smooth, he presented well, likable guy, you know, I met him a few times because he was in the admin of the building right across the street from engineering, and he was, he was really a good guy. He just did the politics wrong of the merger and it ultimately cost him his job, but um, he, uh, one time there, and I think it was in 1970, he gave the engineering department a little budget, like about 5,000 bucks, to build up a Minneapolis Moline puller that can compete with the big guys because there were some pullers out there. They were pulling with the diesels, but the Minneapolis, you know, there's two things in pulling. One is displacement, and the other is RPM. But you couldn't get the RPM of the Minneapolis Moline diesels up high enough. So we turboed a, an LP gas engine and got the RPMs up, and I think we're running about 3,600. And, um, and we're, we'd pull about 500 horsepower with it when you know, it was running right. But anyway, he, Bob was a great guy. Jim Warmly on the other side, he, w he came to Oliver from John Deere. He was supposedly an expert in new generation Deere. He initially came in as VP of marketing, and then he ultimately became president of Oliver, but he lost out to Bob Cumming as president of White Farm. And he just was not as smooth. I met him once because uh, he had to come in and approve the sheet metal for the 2255 before it could go into production. Uh, another really key player, and this guy I've got a lot of respect for, Bob Singer. I don't know if he's uh, alive anymore or not. He was VP of Engineering at Minneapolis Moline. Some people have power because of title and position and stuff like that. They may not be any smarter than you or I, but they got the power because of position. Bob was, had power because he was just smart, smarter than anybody else almost. He had direct access to Neb Bauman, the head of, of uh, White Motor. He got fired at Minneapolis Moon because when they came out with the G900, G1000 tractors, they had a new drivetrain set up and they 
there was a misalignment in the machining of the castings in the rear end. I don't know if it was where the transmission bolted to the rear end or the axle housings, but one of them. And you never want misalignment with, with gears and bearings. It shortens the life greatly, and there's no field fix for it. Anyway, they had some auto spec machine drivetrain housings at the plant, and he was asked to come down there and approve a deviation if they could use them, and he refused, and he got fired. And then Neb Bauman heard about it, and then he sent him out to APD as director of research, and he ultimately came back to Minneapolis Mulliner to the engineering department while I was there. But he, was, he, he had two patents on the hydromechanical transmission. I think he was a big influence in the MM having the upper hand in the white farm equipment merger, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. He was also a real key person in conceiving of the 2255 because in 1972, and they closed the Lake Street plant, which was the end of, of uh, Minneapolis Moline. The sweet spot of the marketplace was 115 to 130 horsepower, and we had nothing in there. The only thing we had prior to that time was the G1350 Moline, which was a 2155 Oliver. But that went away, so we had to move quickly with something, and that was the 2255, and the big decision there was really what engine to use. Um, <clears throat> then there was this Dr. John Beck. He was hired as president of APD, and he was, a, according to Bob Singer, a brilliant and persuasive man. They hired him out of McCullough, you know, the chainsaw people, the people that make little engines of sing. I don't know why they went after him, but they, they wanted him badly. He says, I'll, I'll take this job, but you're going to... I'm not moving, so they, they set up APD out in California where he lived, which I think was a big mistake, but here's the thing. He was a mastermind of the new white engine lineup, and he liked RPM, you can see that there. And um, so his decision was to go with V8s for the truck. Now there's some people say that would probably would have been a big mistake. They never would have been accepted, you know. Uh, this 429 would have been a great engine. And it was, like I said, he had plans to take it up to 190 horsepower running at 2800 RPM. And then there was a four cylinder version of that, which was basically the same bore and stroke, two less cylinders. <clears throat> Last two people we need to talk about, and these are the two that ended all over. Bunky Knudsen, he became president of White Motor Corporation in 1971. He came from GM, he rose through the ranks at GM. He revitalized Pontiac, if you can remember the wide track, you know, and he came with the wide track cars and Grand Prix, all of those were his, his uh, work. He lost out for the top job at GM, and when you lose out for the top job, you have to leave. <clears throat> so he went over to Ford, but he couldn't get along with Lee Iacocca, so he didn't last there very long, but he had the stylist Larry Shinoda, was, they were bolted at the hip. And Larry Shinoda rose quickly in GM. And I think a lot of you are probably old enough here to remember the 1959 Chevrolet Impala with those big fins. Well, that was his doing. And then he did the original Corvette Stingray and he also did the Corvair. I don't know anything about this Boss 302 Mustang, but he did that at Ford when Knudsen was there, Bucky Knudsen. And then when they left Ford, they started this Rectrans RV company, which White Motor had to acquire to get these two guys. Shinoda, he was a, he was a very capable guy, no question about it, but he liked chrome, silver, vibe stripes, and Bunky liked the name Boss, if this is starting to add up with you. All of our pre-merger. Uh, John Culbertson calls it the glory days of Oliver. I said golden years, glory days, 1960s, 50 series tractors. Sam White was president. Roy Rant was product manager. He had a very complete product line. We had this Roy Rant rule that there had to be a tractor model every 13 horsepower because it took 13 more horsepower to pull another plow bottom. That was his thinking. Now, whether or not that was the right number or not, didn't matter. Soil types you know, made a difference, but, but he had a strategy. He had a strategy. And um, 
and if you look at the, all of our equipment lineup, a lot of good stuff. The Rotofall Baylor is as good as you could get. They had this chisel fall with a patented shank that was very unique. Their air planter and, and their plow. They had just good equipment from top to bottom. Oliver was innovative. They dominated the front wheel assist market. For this reason alone, they should still, the brand should still exist, in my opinion. You know, I've got a 23 horse subcompact tractor, Massey Ferguson, front wheel assist. It's the only way you can buy it. It's, it's on everything now, you know. And Oliver dominated that segment. And the reason was because of their cast iron bathtub. They were the only one equipped to take that load, you know from the front to the back, everybody else used their engine as part of their structure. And they didn't want that torsional effect and stuff like that going through their their engine. Bender fuel tanks, great idea. You know, one of the biggest issues in designing a tractor is how do you get enough fuel capacity and where are you gonna put the fuel tank? And a good place to put the fuel tank is not in front of the radiator for two reasons. One is that the front end could get pretty light when the tank got low. Number two is, and this is, I mean, we bought radiators from Modine and John Deere bought radiators from Modine and you learned stuff. But they had a big problem with, with, uh, with because the air was being drawn in on the side just in front of the radiator, recycling, especially if you get a little tailwind. So they had to oversize their radiators to compensate for that. So, I mean, Oliver, so the fender fuel tanks, I mean, where, where do you put the fuel tank was a, a problem, but, and getting capacity, that was just a great, great solution. I'm surprised that other companies didn't do that. There was no patent on it, you know. They're three speed, and then I think, I would say a tractor that was very well balanced. There's more to pulling than uh, Nebraska horsepower ratings of the tractor. It's, it's getting the, power to the, to the ground. And um, Jim, Norman, stand up a minute so everybody knows you. This is a guy that should do a seminar down the road and he could talk about when he was custom plowing with a 1950T and a what, a six bottom? And you were pulling up against John Deere what? One customer I had And he, you had uh, the owners of those John Deere's taking them into the shop, wondering what was wrong with the tractor because they couldn't keep up with Jim. <laughs> Here, you, you need you need to use this. This is a story about my uncle. For years, he owned. An Oliver 1800C and two 1850 gassers. Hated the smell of diesel fuel, but in 1982 he had to go buy a diesel powered tractor. He asked his son what he wanted and he said John Deere. So they brought out a 4440. They used my uncle's five bottom 546 plow that he kept. The 1850 had M&W pistons in it, and it could out pull a 4440 five bottom plow until it got to about 200 horse. <laughs> then it barely <laughs> kept up. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of that uh, is just the tractor balance with the cast iron frame and the cast iron grill. That cast iron grill, you know, it, if you just says, what, what's the best grill you could design for a tractor, you'd say it has to have three things. One is weight, because you need weight on the front end. Number two, you want it to be stout, so when it comes up against another object, the other object gives. And the third thing is that it just looks muscular. And so when you see a tractor off, and you wonder if it's an Oliver, that's probably the first thing you're trying to look for, is that grill to see if you can identify it. But I think. I think that gave a tractor balance that gave all of our performance that the others couldn't match up to. Okay, moving on, uh, certified horsepower. 
And that I think was powerful. We, we heard they paid way too much for it and got nothing, just a lot of debt. So Ed and Henry Redding came in and downsized the company basically and that's made a lot of people mad. But their, their technology was outdated. Your engine was a slow speed. A lot of people liked that, but it was not turbo compatible and turbos are coming. And one of the things that we always talked about in the engineering department, and we didn't have the answer for, was about crankshaft deflection. If you started to push their engines with the four, you know, like the six cylinders having four main bearing crank, and there was really no way to measure that. Probably would be today with computers, but not back then. Transmission was out, as a, out of date as you could get with the sliding spur gears, and they're hard to shift. And I remember, I. Uh, hadn't been to the, at the company too long and they had this conference room in the basement as I said I told them to this meeting in the basement and it was they got a group of engineers together and the purpose of the meeting was to try to brainstorm ways that we could improve sales and MM track this was in the 70s when sales were terrible and I didn't dare say anything because what I wanted to say I didn't think would be received like maybe we should Maybe we should get a nice shift lever at least on that transmission so you can shift it quick. You didn't have to go fishing. And, you know, if they can't get rid of the spur gears quick, at least get a good control, you know. But the only conclusion they could make was this, is that their tractors were too expensive and they had to take cost out. And um, so they had decreasing market share. And if you read here, and this was an interesting article, and this was when Ed Reddick was running the company, uh, and he was talking about the need to merge Minneapolis Moline into something bigger. Because they were ranked sixth out of seven companies. I don't know who was smaller than them. Maybe it was Case, I don't know. Uh, if, if we could merge with a larger concern, it would bring MM up higher in rank. Uh, well, then he, he talks here about that they also had discussions with Case about merging. And he said Case ranked slightly ahead of MM, so it must have been some other company that was smaller. I don't know who that would have been. But So Minneapolis Moline, going into the merger, was on their last leg. They'd pretty much been bled, and it was really the fault of, of management previous to Ed Reddy buying it, very aged, the, the head at that time was 74 years old and they just they had lost their way. Just a quick little bit of a brand comparison here but I'm estimating that all over had 10 to 12 percent of the tractor market. I'm not I didn't I, I just that's kind of from recall. Greg do you know better on this stuff at all? Okay I'm, I'm, I'm estimating three percent for MM so there's big big difference there. The other one here is that what I call a core value, and now these days companies post core values on the, you walk into the building and you see them, but that wasn't the case there, but I think what that's what drove their behavior and their culture, and at all of our, it was innovation, in my opinion. At MM, it was all about their engine. They just hung their hat on their engine, and after that, a value tractor, and they weren't very creative. Now when I say that, they, they, had, they did a couple things that were creative. One was the G1000 Vista doing that operator platform, and Bob Singer was responsible for that, and he said he, he could not get that design through his own engineering department. He had to sub it out to a firm in Detroit to get it done. Um, but, and then when they went to the 50 series, they left that design. So now we're to the merger. Uh, you're probably getting bored to death of this stuff, but this was in 69, Neb Bauman was running White Motor, Sam White was gone, we call it, uh, they moved him up and out. They promoted him to a job in Cleveland that didn't exist and he's soon gone. But the official word, he was promoted to Cleveland, but he was really fired because he wouldn't cook the books. So then Bob coming. President of MM, and we talked about this, replaced him. So Bob was the one that pulled off this first round of merger and tucked Oliver into MM. The headquarters in engineering are moved to Hopkins. 
So the Oliver peop people in Oak, I think they were in Oakbrook, Illinois, moved to Hopkins, and the engineering department from Charles City moved up to Hopkins. And all the key positions went to MM people. From a product standpoint, they're still planning on the corporate tractor, and it was supposed to have been introduced in 1971 when I started in 1970. Um, they had a lot of prototypes built of the corporate tractor. I don't know what the brand name would have been. I don't think that had been decided yet, but all the prototypes were painted all over colors, and they had tried the white name on the MM50 series, on that nose piece, front of the grill, and also on the 55 series, and it didn't last long. They had to take it off, the white name, because it wasn't received. But John Culbertson writes this in his book about this whole thing, and this was messy. In a fier fiercely fought battle between executives of Oliver and MM for top spots and white farm equipment, the nod for, most part, for the most part went to MM. Before the year was over, MM had clearly won by grabbing all the top positions, leaving all of her staffers clutching only the lower rungs of the ladder. <clears throat> it wasn't pretty nor pleasant. The whole process of putting together a top-notch staff was never a question of selecting the most qualified, but simply a matter of politics, power politics. While we at Charles City were mindful of the power struggle being waged up north, our job was to build quality tractors, and that is what we did. And that's, in the end, what won out. So that was, that was in 1969, no, 1970. Neb Bauman has removed top of White Motor Corporation. It was expensive, but he was terminated. Bob Cumming was still White Farm Equipment President. White Consolidated Industries and White Motor Corporation agreed to a merger with White Consolidated Industry, basically getting the upper hand. And Ed Reddig, who was President of White Consolidated Industries, stepped in to run White Motor Corporation. That's the Ed Reddig that was the guy that you know that did the hostile takeover of Minneapolis Moline. And that scared us all. Ed. Ed you know, everybody feared Ed, and um, so, but Ed, so he, he, he was in control for six months, and he believed that the White Farm Equipment merger was a mistake, and he wanted to divide into three operating groups, Oliver, Minneapolis Moline, and South Bend, and he closed the Shelbyville plant, and he planned to build a new admin building in Charles City, and and the ad and people and engineering from Hopkins would have been moved to there. So that was an announced move that never took place. He killed the white engine and the corporate tractor, leaving a huge product hole. That's why we had to move quickly with the 2255. Like I said, he was in charge for six, only six months, but he had a six, uh, significant impact on the, on the future. And Bob Singer says this, and he had to work with Ed. He says, although we feared and dreaded Ed, he did force changes which it produced, you know, improved and more efficient operations. But so here, this is an interesting scenario. Ed was going to keep the brands. And if this could have stuck, maybe this would have been a good deal. I think I think the whole outcome of the farm group, I don't I don't think white farm would have been spun off from white motor because all that happened with white motor after they got spun out is they got worse owners you know but what happened was that merger was killed by the justice department because white consolidated industries own 30 percent of ls chalmers now that to me is really interesting because what do you have with agco today it's alice and white and massey and more but here they killed it. So again, I think if that round two could have stayed in place, might have been a really good deal. So then they have no head, and where are they going to go? And Bunky Knudsen was available. He had he was unemployed, and so they hired him as president of White Motor Corporation. And we really thought that would be good. We thought Bunky had quite a reputation as a, a you know successful executive, and and. Uh, 
The first thing he did is fire Bob Cumming, and the reason he did is there are so many complaints from the field on, on Bob Cummings process of merging that uh, he, he had to take him out. And the story was this, John Culbertson writes about it, but Bob Cumming was invited to Cleveland for his first meeting with Bunky, and he waited for two hours in the lobby to get into the office, and when he got in, he was going to you know, shake Bunky's head, hand, and Bunky just says, wouldn't shake his hand, he says, don't sit down, you're no longer employed, you know, he was fired. <laughs> And that was the way Bunky operated. He did the same thing to Jim Warmly, but in the end, but he, so he brought Jim Warmly back and that maybe wasn't so good either. Jim was actually president when, when we did the 2255. Uh, but then the decision was made to move admin to Chicago and engineering to Libertyville, Illinois. And that's what did end up happening. That's when I left, no interest in going there. And, uh, a lot of other people left too, I can just tell you that. That was not a good deal for the engineering department. He closed the Lake Street plant, which is effectively in Minneapolis Moline. He brought in his buddy, Larry Shinoda, the stylist, set up a corporate design center in Detroit to design all the new line of trucks and tractors that were gonna come out. Uh, and Larry Shinoda led the change over to White. So these are the two guys, Bunky and Larry Shinoda, that ended all over and came up with White and they created the Field Boss line because Bunky liked the name Boss, Shinoda liked Silver Chrome and Five Stripes. And that's what we ended up with. You can see it on a tractor over here. Um, and I would just say this about, you know, clearly Shinoda was talented. All over had this stylist, Wally Drogamy, where I, th I thought really did a good job. And of course he got aced out here in this process and uh, it's kind of too bad because uh, Wally did the um, he did the three-digit models and then all the four-digit work. And, and you take a couple of his styling elements, like that cast iron grill and the side spear, which started with the B series. He got that from Cox. They, you know, the 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 life of styling elements isn't very long. Four or five years is it. But those two things lasted like that grill for, what, 15 years. That's, that's unusual. So he did, he did all over a, a really good job, but he lost out to Shinoda. And, and Bunky and Larry Shinoda had no respect for the brands. That's what's really disappointing. They came in on their white horses with arrogant, with you know, their arrogance and did what they wanted. And so John Culbertson writes, with Jim warmly running the show, a not so subtle realignment was quickly made. More and more key people from the old Oliver family moved to the forefront and executives of the old MM regime were shoved to the background. One observer remarked when Minnie Moe was in charge, they tried to commit fratricide against Oliver and when the table turned, Oliver reciprocated. But here's a key point, be that as it may, it is remarkable that the company survived the internal wars and continued on for two more years. So, just some final thoughts here. So what was the root cause of White's failure? Well, it was just simply, I think, two things. Too much debt and then bad market conditions hitting in 1970. Both trucks and tractors, cash flow, just non-existent. Neb Bauman's divorce. Uh, and Bob Singer writes quite a bit about that in his book, but his ex-wife ended up with a whole bunch of white motor stock that was bought in margin, and they had to come up, come up with cash to cover it, and they didn't have any cash, because market conditions were so poor, so they opened up the factories. I remember going down to Charles City in 1970, and I never saw so many, I've never seen so many Olivers as what was in, in the field east of the plant. And they just overran the factories, truck and tractors, and came up with some kind of creative uh, financing plan to pay for the tractors so they could show it on a book as revenue. And that was the cooking the books process that I think about <coughs> Sam White. He wouldn't play, play ball with it. But, but overrunning the factories, somewhere I read it resulted in the factories being closed for almost two years. Terrible. Uh, the other thing I think in White's case is that, that APD, that development cycle out there, took too long. 
and in particular not getting the components into tractor designs fast enough. That was, and this is where Oliver messed up. And I think also with APD in California, it was too disconnected from the tractor and truck engineering groups, you know, too isolated. What happened to Oliver, I, I, I still think they're, in the long run, their strategy of, quote, partnering with Waukesha was not a good one because after the Fleetline models came out, which delivered two series of engines that got bored a few times to tweak them up a little bit, uh, there was nothing more. And if, if Oliver had had its own engine, if they had, would have decided to build their own engines in Charles City, and they could have, and the reason they didn't, if you read in uh, Herb Morell's book, is they didn't think they could find the labor to support an engine factory in Charles City. It might have been true, I don't know. But maybe they should have gone a few towns away and built it. But if they would have had their own engine, white, they would not have been attracted to white motor. White motor may never have bought them, you know. Uh, Clara the ouster of Sam White. Uh, I think their lack of stepping up to bring the corporate tractor to market was a big mistake. I, it, it's, I, could, I could see no evidence of Oliver doing any prototyping of the corporate tractor. Uh, and I don't know why. And I, I just this comment, I can't explain the 55 series product be, plan because it doesn't look anything like Sam White, anything like what Sam White, uh, White or Roy Grant would do. I don't know who was calling those shots. And that was part of the getting rid of the certified horsepower and stuff like that. The sweet spot of the marketplace was at that time it was 115 to 130 horsepower and all that was in there was a 2155 and that was not a good tractor to sell to the Oliver people. They should have had a 2155 based on the 2150 and they chose not to do that. Uh, it feels like the MM people may have been sort of running things at this point in time, you know, dropping the certified horsepower and then I always have to give credit to Wally Drogamiller. I got to work with him quite a bit. He had an office in our engineering department. I spent a lot of time with him. The guy was a wizard. He could sketch, he was always sketching. If you wanted to know what management was thinking about down the road, you go into Wally's office because they, that's the first place they'd go is have him do some renderings of what it would look like. It's fun to talk to him. And he, he took great pride. And he had responsibility for not just tractor design, but the entire product line. One day I was in his office and he took out the all of our product brochure. He started to go through and showed me the little things he did. And I don't know if you remember the, the little things he did to tie the product line together, but the one I remember was, and I wrote this in our club newsletter not long ago, but there was this little triangular spear type thing he put on the plow bottom. I don't know if you recall that. That was his touch. That was just his way of tying that into the all of our overall design of things. So one last thing. Uh, what gave MM the upper hand? And I think Bob Singer was a key guy here because he saw, he was out at APD and the engines were ready to go. The factory in Canton was built, the tooling was in place, all they had to do was turn it on. That's from what I heard. And it was a state-of-the-art engine factory. And there was no, but there was no tractor. And Oliver was not stepping up to the plate. He called the MM engineering departments that start designing a corporate tractor and Mike Verholst stepped up and the way they went and they did it quickly. That's my thought, you know, that's one reason. The second is that Bob Cumming was simply was stronger than Jim Warmley. He got the upper hand when Sam White was pushed out and then and, and, and he made it a political deal. He wasn't gonna turn on his MM guys. And so he, he basically rolled all over into MM but it, it, it couldn't hold, it was the wrong thing to do. That's why it had to be redone twice. So anyway, I've taken too long. Uh, oh, one more thing I have to talk about. Oliver's brand assets, I think this is an important thing. Corporations spend a lot of money promoting their brand, and they have to to keep it alive, to keep it in front of customers. It's, it's flipped now. The responsibility of keeping all of our brand ass assets alive, we don't have that corporate umbrella, it's us. That's why we have to do these things, you know, and, and share the stories and display the iron and take them to the field and put them in parades and restore them and you name it. So I, I thought, what are some of all of our brand assets? 
And I'm just thinking mainly of the tractors here now, but uh, first is the name, Oliver. It's the best name in the industry. There is no nickname. Does Toyota have a nickname or a Honda or a Ford? No. It's a simple, solid name. It's not Deere rather than John Deere. It's not IH rather than International Harvester or, you know, Minnie Mo or Alice rather than Alice Chalmers. It's a simple, solid name. You know, White was okay, but it was a sewing machine name, you know, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Mano Green and Clover White, great colors. I mean, just look at it. You know, they restored tractors. Well, the silver and chrome, I suppose you could say it's okay, but it got dated, you know. It's that type of thing that gets dated. It wasn't a real durable color either. Uh, the cast iron grill, we talked about that, couldn't beat it. Well, chrome plastic grill, you know, looked nice. It looked nice for a while at least, you know. I remember when they were designing that grill, I didn't work on it, but that was a challenge to get that thing done in chrome like that. But Shinoda insisted on it. Uh, the side spear, you know, I think was a really good marking. And again, I heard that from Coxa, but that's, the grill is probably the first thing you look at when you see a tractor off, always, see if it's an all over. Side spear is the second thing. Well, the vibe stripes, you know, they didn't last very long and they're gone. Cast iron bathtub, front wheel assist, vendor fuel tanks, the, the tractor balance and the resulting overall field performance. And then innovation, like I said, throughout the product line. I think these are all assets that we have to continue to keep alive and uh, remind ourselves of and enjoy as we have opportunities. So I apologize for taking longer than I wanted to, but I don't know if you have any questions. I guess if you do, you can. A couple things, whether it's factor efficient. I read that the decision to go away from the Perkins engine after the 1850 and strictly go to a turbocharged walk us off was over $348 difference in the price of the engine. So to keep the price of the tractor down, they went with the walk us off instead of the Perkins. Okay, did you hear that? That the reason they put the replaced the Perkins with the walk us off is because of cost. Might, might be true, you know, could very well have been true. But here's what I heard, and, I, and the, the person I heard it from was Bob Prunty, and Bob Prunty was chief engineer. And he said the reason they didn't use the Hercules, realize that product plans are made year, year and a half, sometimes two years ahead of hitting the market. So you're, when you were making the product plans for, let's say, the 55 series, uh, they're, they're still, I think, living with hangover from issues with both the Herc and the Perkins, and there was a, Oliver felt that that they were not getting the same quality engine that Massey was getting in the 354, and they were really upset about it, and I think, I think there were oil burning and ring seating issues and th things like that, and Massey wasn't having those problems, and Oliver wasn't. Oliver went to try to solve the problem, and again, this is what I heard from Bob Prunty, and they started to work with Perfect Circle, a ring company, to find a different ring that would they could put them in and solve this problem. And Perkins heard about that, they almost cut them off. And so the relationship became very poor at that point in time. And that obviously healed. And then the Hercules had an issues, it was, I think, probably hustled into production a little bit too quickly on the 2150. And all that stuff got resolved. And what's interesting how both those engines, the Herc, and the Perkins became staples down the road in the 2105 line, you know. I can say this, when we were working on the 2255 and there was some debate about what engine to use, Ford took a really hard run at us with their 401. It was a pretty good engine. Might have been a good choice, but they, they really wanted that cat name and they didn't want to put a competitor's engine in there. But, but Perkins was back at the table trying to, you know, get, like I said, sell, sell engines again to us but so I you know there probably was a cost difference but there was a relationship working relationship problem at that point in time when I worked at the dealership we had issues with the bowling tractors and the white uh, 
not necessarily the white 150, but with 585 Moline engines that a mesh mesh machined uh, area where you bolted the oil pumps in, I heard different rumors about that. I heard upset Oliver guys tweaked it. I heard it got hurt in transport when they were moving back and forth between manufacturings. What is your take on why that dive for that engine got messed up? You're talking about the misalignment of some kind of, yeah. yeah. I can tell you what Mike Burroughs told me. Mike Burroughs knew most of this stuff, but there was a, a print error. And, and they discovered eventually, and a lot of times when you had to make a quick change, we'd do what's called a marked up print. The engineer would mark it up, make the change, sign it, and, and then manufacturing could make it, you know, the change immediately. So they did a marked up print to fix it at Lake Street, and it got fixed. But the prints never got changed. And when the thing moved back to, to Charles City, the problem came back because they started with the prints again. I don't know if it's the same problem that... Yeah, because I, I got uh, basically a camshaft from the 2150 that's got 150 hours on it, and the oil pump's out of the sheet off it, and then we updated it, and it did it turn off. Anybody else? Nice fucking truck. Now, did you ever see that? Like what? Oh, what? Oh, what? Yeah, that's what should have happened, Bill. My business. That would be the Oliver, but they went to the Molina.